Oh man, it's 9.40 in the a.m. again. Today is 10-3-17, 2017. What's up everybody? My name's Russ, rwresearch.com. So um, I'm gonna elaborate more on this today. And what I'd like to do is then move to the bench and actually demonstrate some of these basic principles to you. Um, but before we get started, not everyone could really grasp the concept that I was trying to share here. And if you have no idea what this mess is on the board, um, please go watch video number four, and then you'll understand what this is and what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about energy stored in a capacitor, and I'm talking about it flowing back and forth. And I was very specific. The one important key I was trying to share with you was that the load doesn't consume the energy but instead it discharges itself okay so a battery discharges itself a capacitor will discharge itself it has resistance inside of it right so the resistance inside of the battery and the resistance well actually the battery is a little different but the resistance inside a capacitor will deplete itself that's why when you charge it up and you take the voltage off it starts dropping down it's neutralizing um, some of you couldn't quite grasp that. So I was talking to my friends and there was a really simple example brought up. So I'm going to show you. Um, by the way, um, I don't know if I just said this, but we're going to go to the bench at the end of this video. It's pretty lengthy, but if you want to see some practical demonstrations on the bench of me trying to show you some stuff, you'll want to watch this video. So I was trying to share with you that energy okay is not consumed by the load okay so you don't lose the energy and what is energy well it's really a difference in potential neutral states right so if everything is neutral then you really don't have any you don't really have any stored energy if you want to think of it this way um, by the way, these are just my thoughts and ideas. Some of them may be slightly skewed, but I'm trying to just give everyone a visual and understanding. So I have water here in a cup. I have no water here in a cup. Okay. I've got about, I know that's really hard to see. I've got about 200 milliliters of water in there. So you could say that the water, right, is the potential energy that I have, the, uh, the volume of the water is how much energy I have, and the height, right, is like the voltage, okay? So if I have energy stored in potential energy, right, and I have an empty glass here, <clears throat> Now I have no more energy left in this one, but I have the exact same amount of energy that was in here, now it's in here. So I didn't lose any, right? I didn't lose any of the energy, right? Watch this. And see the little residue, the little residual bit of water that's inside here? That could be actually considered some loss in the system but however it's still in there it's just in different places right so I didn't lose any of my stored potential now what happens if I put a turbine in between these two jars and just spun the turbine look at that I just spun the turbine again I could do this all day and spin the, spin the turbine so what's the difference here well we're talking about gravity that's why I didn't want to talk about liquids but Electricity is probably definitely more like a liquid, right? Like a hydraulic liquid, something uncompressible, basically. But I could do this all day, and then you could argue the point, well, it takes, it takes energy, right, to lift this back up. It takes work to lift this back up, but energy is still stored here, okay? Now, what happens if I add a resistance, right? So now I have a funnel, All right? I can only, I can only get it going so fast. But guess what? 
I still got 200 milliliters of water. I still have my, my full stored potential. Right? No different. So this is what I'm trying to express. Now, if you guys want free energy, that's what you're after, go live by a, a waterfall. Happy days, man. Have fun. Go find yourself a nice place next to a little waterfall. Generate as much power as you ever wanted. Right? If I've got a... Uh, that's a great... That's a great picture. Right? If I've got a reservoir of water... Right? And I poke a hole... Yeah, on this reservoir, and it happens to be on the edge of a mountain, then any of the water that comes out and goes here, right, and gets stored again down here in some other reservoir, right, if I put a turbine, generator, whatever, right there, guess what? All I got to do is sit back and let, let nature fill this up for me. However that, however that happens, could be a spring underground or whatever. But the point is, is that all this water here, right, if this is empty and this is full and all this drains down here, you still have the exact same amount of energy. You just have it in a new place, right, and it's at a different potential as well. But if this happened again, you could do this however many times it takes to get down the mountain and every place you put this generator, this turbine would generate power. So this is like, you know, this isn't the best example ever, but it's a really easy one to wrap your head around going, oh, the energy, right, is never really used. It's just applied, okay? So anyway, I'll leave that alone. Let's move on to the next subject. All right, so, um, we're going to be moving to the bench and I'm going to be demonstrating some of these principles that I was sharing with you in the last video. Again, I'm not going over that, so if you want to know what I'm doing on the bench, go watch this. Um, but there's an important thing that we need to talk about. So don't forget we're doing physics, right, and this is very important. So what we're going to do is we're going to transfer voltage or stored potential from one capacitor to another. Okay, so if I have... 2 capacitors, right, and these guys are 1 farad each, okay, 1 farad each, and we connect a uh, wire here, right, so this is our technical zero voltage, right, a negative, a negative potential. And then we're going to say this is our positives. All right. Let's say we start out here, okay, with 20 volts. And here we start out with 0 volts. I guess we'll use orange. So step one, okay, we got 20 and 0. And when we do a transfer, right, we're basically going to be putting a, a wire right across here and we're going to be shorting the two out. So if I have 20 volts here and it's a 1 farad capacitor, so if I have 20 volts here and I have a 1 farad capacitor, okay, how many stored joules, right? Because we gotta, we got to discuss joules. Now personally, I like George's. If you want to know what that is, you can go look it up. But we have to do it this way. Or this is the way it's normally done. So we'll do it. We'll talk about how this is normally working. So if we want to talk about um, joules, then this is 200 joules. Okay, 20 volts, 200 joules in a one farad capacitor. All right, that's easy enough, right? Well, there's a potential problem here. Let's say we do the transfer. 
Okay, so in phase two, right, we do the transfer, and now, okay, here we have 10 volts, and here we have 10 volts. Perfect, right? We've split it, we haven't lost any energy, we have exactly 10 volts, but now it's spread across two capacitors. Well, that's great, but 10 volts across one farad, or stored in one farad, okay, is actually oh my help me out <laughs> 50 joules <laughs> okay so in step one right we have a total of 200 uh, joules right and if we add these up 50 and 50 we have 100 joules, so that's half the energy, half of the energy, half of the stored potential, right? That's a, that's a problem. So when we just measure, right, voltage, we didn't lose any voltage, right? Let's add up our voltage. 20 volts and 0 volts is what? 20 volts. 10 volts and 10 volts is what? 20 volts. So I'm bringing this up and it's probably going to actually confuse you because I want you to focus on this principle that the load doesn't consume the energy. But no matter what we do here, if we do this scenario, guess what happens? We lose half of our stored potential in joules. Okay, like I said, look up George's. That's a different ball game, and I think that's a better way to do this. But I brought this up for one main reason. Okay, I want to discuss what I think about how this is working. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to give you a second scenario. So the second scenario, um, we're going to do it like like this. Okay, scenario two. So this is capacitors. What happens if we use batteries. But before I get to batteries, there is uh, something to note here. So one farad and one farad in series, when you connect them like this, if you were to measure out here, okay, you would actually measure 0.5 farad, okay? See now? That's why you measure this half because you only have 0.5 of a farad. Now, if I put these capacitors in series, I'm sorry, in parallel, right? These are series. If I put them in parallel, and they were both one farad, how much capacitance? Well, this one would equal two farad. So here you add them. Here, the math is different. I'm not going to draw the math. You can go look it up. So, what does that mean? That means if I have 10 volts, okay, let's do the same thing here. Throw in my markers. 10 volts, all right, in each one, it's still only 10 volts, but 10 volts across two farads guess what? It's still 100 joules. And if I had 20 volts, right? So if this is 10 volts, it's 100 joules. 20 volts is how much? It's actually 400 joules. So anyway, I'm bringing this up for one important reason. When you take series capacitors, you have 0.5 farad. When you take parallel capacitors, you have two. That's if all of them were one farad. But, like I just mentioned, what happens if you have batteries? Right? 
So if I connect these batteries in series, or if I connect these batteries in parallel, let's make the math easy. If this is one amp hour, all right, and these are one, well, we can do 10 volts again. And these are 10 volts, one amp hour, 10 volts. Okay, so I'm not gonna write it on all of them. They're all one amp hour, 10 volts. So if I connect them like this, right, and I measure my potential, right, if I measure the potential here, guess what I get? 20 volts. Now here, what happens when I measure the potential? Well, it's only 10 volts, right? Series parallel. But now let's do the math for the amp hours. So these amp hours don't change. It's still one amp hour. Here, however, something completely the same happens up there, right? You added these two together. Here, is you, did, here you did the math to get 0.5, okay? So the amp hours here is actually two amp hours. But what's the voltage? 10 volts. So what I'm trying to I'm trying to show you here is I'm trying to make this a practical demonstration of why I'm trying to tell you that capacitors don't pass current. And and again this is my viewpoint. It's probably not all technically 100% correct, but it's my viewpoint. So in batteries, right? What are batteries? They're 2 volt cells usually. So 2 2 2 2 6 of those make a 12 volt battery. So what happens if you just put another bank of six of those two volt cells where you get 24 volts, right? Your amp hours stay the same, but you get now 20 volts across there. Up here, right, if you do the calculation for the amount of stored energy, which I'm not gonna do, but if you do that, you'll see that this doesn't apply here. And it's because what's trapped in between these two capacitors, right, this space right here, doesn't get added into the equation but it's because current can't flow. That's my viewpoint on it. You know, right? If current can't flow here, then it doesn't work. But here, current can flow. So I didn't do the best at trying to make my point here, but you get what I'm trying to say, and I'll leave it at that. So what, you, what I'm saying is sometimes when you hook up capacitors in series like this, you automatically kind of screw yourself up but at the exact same time, you know, it allows you to sort of isolate the current that could be flowing between these two capacitors, right? So a capacitor always wants to stay at an equal, like, charge potential. It always wants to balance out. So if you apply charge here, it just magically wants to show up here. Um, so anyway, I wanted to get this out of my head and on the board, and hopefully it made sense to you. And let's move on to the next subject real quick. All right, so hopefully I've proven my point that current cannot flow through a capacitor, especially because this works out just like it does. Now I'm sure you electrical engineers are gonna throw a whole different slight viewpoint at it, and that's perfectly fine, but I'm just trying to make a, a, a valid thought process here. So please debate this and let me know what your thoughts are, but that's kind of my thoughts. So we're gonna to move to the bench now. And the thing is, is these experiments did not work out 100% like I wished because things aren't perfectly matched. But in the end, it gives you an idea, a demonstration that you don't lose any voltage, right? You don't lose any voltage. You're just putting it in different containers, okay? So this is what I'm saying. Let's say I'm going to transfer through a resistor. Well, if I transfer through a resistor, at some point, I get 
50-50. Now if I were to take this and do something with it, I only have half the potential. But did I lose the energy? Well, no, the rest is right here. I'm just removing it from the equation because I'm just dealing with one. Right? So the energy is still here. You still have the full amount of energy in these two glasses. Remember, the energy is the water. The height is like the, vol the voltage. And the volume of water is like, you know, the capacity of the energy that it, can, that it has. So, you know, I can pour the rest of this over here and we're good. All right now I got it all here. So that's what happens across the resistor in this regular resistive situation. Now when we add a motor, pump, flywheel, inductor, you know, I describe this many different ways, but when you have that, you actually have um, a siphoning effect. All right, so like I said, this is why I don't use, like using uh, water because we have to deal with gravity and that's something that's not totally awesome. But if I were to hold this, right? Uh -uh. Now look. Okay, it's it's now a type of inductor. Okay, where I've started flow, and because in this case. I'm not going to go into that because, like I said, this gets way too deep. But in this case, we're actually able to transfer right, all of the energy from one cup to another because we started the system and the system created an, an effect, in this case using gravity, to transfer all that water to the other jar. Okay. So that's, that's basically this idea of a motor inductor. And so I'm going to show you that on the bench. So anyway, let's move on to the bench. I know this wasn't quite as fundamental and deep as the last video, but we'll get to those in later videos. Right now I want to demonstrate the simple principles I was discussing here on the bench. And I do mention this capacitor paradox on the bench. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. And I also wanted to point out that with batteries, amp hours don't do the same thing, right? Capacity is the amp hours, but it doesn't follow the same rules as capacitors because here you can transfer all those, all that potential through the system because current can flow through the whole thing, right? Individually and inside. And here it's, it's completely isolated, which is useful for us, right? Capacitors are useful, but not when we hook them series to parallel and try to do some battery swapping and stuff like this. It gets a little it gets a little tricky with capacitors, but batteries seem to be a better option for that. All right, let's move to the bench. Here we go. Alrighty, welcome to the bench. So we're going to try to demonstrate some basic principles here. Nothing too crazy, but it will be uh, hopefully helpful. And we're going to, yeah, see what happens. So we've got some capacitors here. These are 475 UF each. And I'm going to attach a bunch of stuff to them right now. So first, a green wire. The green wire is nothing more than the ground on my power supply, so I don't have to connect it every single time. We do a charge discharge. All right, so we got a scope lead ground and a scope lead ground. And then this red wire is for discharging when I want to discharge the caps. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and connect this scope lead. It is the blue one. It's going to be our zero voltage cap. And then we're going to connect the yellow one here, which, uh, that's okay, which is uh, going to be our charged cap. So here is our charge. So what I need to do first is just reference how fast the capacitor self discharges so the internal resistance okay so what I'm gonna do is I, I got a charge right now okay I'm gonna let it discharge and I'm gonna capture this discharge alright so 
we're going to go measure it now, basically. Uh, we'll put this cursor there. And we'll get this cursor to set at about 5 seconds. So it's about 1.6 volts for every 5 seconds, right? And the closer it gets to zero, it's, it dips. It's not perfectly linear. But I'm going to be starting my tests around these voltages, 60 volts. So there's your reference for self-discharge, and uh, now we know what that is. So I'm going to set this back to 10, put this guy back on 3. I've got these um, offset at 3 volts, so 0 is 3 volts. <clears throat> so if I discharge it, there it goes. Let me turn my cursors off. Let's do measure. So I'm going to go in. Okay, so what I'm going to do is charge this cap up. I'm going to turn my trigger on so that I capture a um, falling edge. I'm going to put it on single trigger. Actually, I need to put this back on that for a second. Okay, single trigger. And now when I discharge across... So, so what I'm going to demonstrate to you is the capacitor paradox. So right now we've got, let's see where we're at. Now, well, not, right now we've got 63.2 volts, and when I let this go, this number is going to start dropping. Right. So we'll measure exactly where we actually do the discharge. But what I want to show you is the fact that when we discharge these capacitors, so this capacitor into this one we actually lose half our potential if we were calculating joules. And there's a pretty good reason for that, I think. But what we want to demonstrate is what happens when we just do a discharge. What, what voltage do we get left? We shouldn't lose any of our voltage potential. right? So the voltage p potential across here should add up. We shouldn't lose any energy, per se. All right? And I'm going to solder on this little wire, maybe, so that we can do this a little bit easier. All right, there we go. So hopefully you can see everything there. So I'm going to discharge that one. I'm going to charge up this one and set it back to a single trigger and do the discharge. Okay, so again, let's add up our total voltage. Right, we start at 63.2 here our maximum is 32 okay and then our minimum which is our low side right on this capacitor drop this capacitor charged so at 30.8 62.8 so we're just a tiny bit off I'm gonna do it again purely for your sake I've done this a thousand times already but for your sake, I'll do it again. 30.8, 31.6, okay, 31.6 plus 30. Point, um, 31.6 plus. Hold on, we'll get it right eventually. 30.8 plus 30. 1.6, right, 62.4. So we're 0.4 off, which is which happens just to be purely because of the scaling we're on. So now what I'm going to do, that's a dead short, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this across a resistor. So I have a 100 ohm resistor. It's attached to a lead just so I can hold it nicely. And I'm going to do the exact same thing but I'm going to do it across this resistor. Matter of fact, I am going to solder the resistor so that it's easier for us to work with. So a dead short brings us to an equal voltage. And we could do this a bunch more times. But you can do this yourself if you want to get if you want to prove it to yourself over and over and over. I've done this enough times. So what is a resistor going to do? It is only going to change the time of which it takes to balance these caps out. Right? It's 100 ohms, so do the calculation. I'm going from about 60 volts to 30 volts across 100 ohm resistance. You can calculate the power if you wish. 
therefore we should lose energy according to what everyone else seems to think. So that's what I'm trying to show you here is we don't. So we already know we lose half by a dead short because that's the capacitor paradox. So now what we're going to do, I'm still going to use this to short it a little easier. So now what we're going to do is we're going to short this and it should only change the time variance. Uh, we need to go a lot closer to see it, but there it is. So I'm going to I'm going to do this again. Okay, charge up our cap. The resistor. There it is. Check our voltages. 30.8. That's exactly what we had last time. 31.6. That's exactly what we had last time. Right? 31.6. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the wire. So now we're going to short out just the wire on the same time scaling here so you can kind of see see what we're doing. So let's short this one out. Let's charge this one up. Yowzers. Okay. Here we go. So we made an extra little spike in there, which I don't like. That's why I like the, the wider time scales. But here we go. So, so there you can see how fast. Right now, don't look at the voltages too much because we got a little spikes going on here. But just look at the, um, look how fast, right? I mean, we should look at the voltages, but we did that earlier with a bigger time scale. So now we're going to do the exact same test through the resistor again. All right, so now we're going to do it again with the resistor. And you can see the time variance. But our voltages are the same. Matter of fact, it's a little bit higher this time. So what does that tell us? That tells us the 100 ohm resistor did not use any of the energy. The current flew, flew through it, the energy flew through it, but we didn't lose anything because it's the exact same amount of potential to begin and end with. So now we're going to move over to the inductor. I have a diode here. All right, I've got it marked on the back so we can see it on the bench down here. So I'm just going to solder up the inductor. I'm going to show it, or the, uh, sorry, the, um, did I say inductor? Anyway, I meant to say bridge, um, diode. This is our, this is our check valve. Okay. Hook this back up. So now, what I'm going to demonstrate with the inductor attached. Here's the inductor. Don't be alarmed, the wires are just stuck there on the end like that. That's how it was made. So we're going to attach the inductor. Okay, now what's going to happen? Well, earlier we, we proved to ourselves, right, that the capacitor paradox is real and unfortunately we only got half the voltage in each one which which in storage potential it changes everything but as far as voltage is concerned there it is right so that's our pressure in our tank so now we added a check valve which is our diode and we've added a pump and a motor so this is a motor at first and then a pump so if we think of this as flowing water in a pipe once the water starts flowing, it has momentum, and then it has to slow back down. And during that slowdown process, it will actually suck this thing as dry as it possibly can, according to the rest of the physics of flow. And, and you know, if we were going to talk about air, you could talk about CFM and the pipe diameter and right, the resistance. All that stuff is intermixed here. But what I want to show to you is that I can transfer this potential into this here. Well, what does that mean if we do that? Well, that means that the capacitor paradox kind of goes away because we have full potential back over here. 
Now, like I said, we don't get full potential, but we get pretty close. So I'm going to go ahead and charge this up and make sure this guy's discharged. All right, and here we go. Oops, you saw it, but I didn't, uh, it transferred, see it, but I didn't set the uh, trigger. Let me do it again. Whoops. I hit default undo. Okay. Single choir. Here we go. Okay, you ready? All right, here we go. So, there we go. Right? We started at 62.8. We got two, volt, two volts left in the yellow, which is this capacitor. And we got two volts left there. And we got 60 volts over here. So we transferred almost all the energy through the inductor, built up a nice magnetic field, I'm sure. Right? And we did that transfer. This acted as a check valve, didn't allow it to go backwards. So I'm going to do that a few more times just to show you. We can get it even better. Maybe not better, but we can kind of better. I'll show you. So here we go again. We can get it closer to our math anyway. So 2, all right, plus 59.2. So we got a tiny little drop there, probably due to my poor ability to make a good connection. So we're going to do it again anyway. All right, not quite as clean as I would like, but you get the point. So what does that mean? That means we could transfer this energy and then we could do it again. We could flip this and we could do it again. But what happens, right? What happens when we take the diode out? So if we remove the diode, I get some of that solder over there. If we remove the diode, what should we see? Well, apparently the telephone. So now we've taken the diode out and we're going to just use the inductor. So what we should see is an oscillation between these two capacitors through the inductor here. Now the end result is that the energy should basically be equal in both of these, but we're going to get a really big oscillation, a nice oscillation back and forth, back and forth. The energy is being used over and over and over instead of just being transferred and heating up this resistor in the process. Okay, here we go. Isn't that pretty? I'm going to do it again move it over a little bit there so we can get even more in here. All right, here we go. So, there you go. That's an oscillation. So how many times did we use that energy? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and so on and so on. 20x times. Now why does it get, why does it do this? You know, of course, this is like a ringing bell. You hit it once, and it rings and rings and rings and rings, right? This is the idea of what resonance is, is if you dump a little bit of energy at the right spot, you can get this oscillation to go bigger instead of dampening. So we're actually just seeing this inductor pass the energy back and forth. But what's the end result? Well, let's do it again. This time we're even a little bit further out. The end result is what? Is that we have the exact same effect as if we just shorted it out, or the exact same effect as if we just used it across a resistor, or a light bulb, or some other resistive load. But we generated a magnetic field here, which we could have used. Now this is a huge, small, little bitty scale, so you, you know, it did, but this would be hard to use. You need a little bit different process to make that work. But this is usable. So it just means we oscillated this back and forth. We did a whole bunch more than we did with just the resistor on its own. 
So now I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you what happens when I connect a regular wire. Well, actually, you know what? We're going to try something else. So I want to demonstrate something to you. We had, we had the diode in there, right? And what did the diode do? Did I, it, what did the diode... What did the diode do? It acted as a check valve. Well, what happens if we do this really, really, really fast? And we do it so fast that we don't even give it time to oscillate back. This is actually very difficult to do, but it can be done. And actually, it's easier to do on the wire. So don't be alarmed. I'm just going to do this so that I can use the wire as a switch and make it a little bit faster. Okay, so exact same. We'll do it again just to just to show you it's the exact same. Oh. Oh, there. Actually, that's exactly what I was trying to do. But I gotta make a good, a really good connection to get that nice ring out of it. So, here we go. So there's our nice ring. Now what I'm gonna try to do is what I just explained. I'm basically using the fact that I am able to unconnect it fast enough to just do a transfer. not fast enough. Charge, discharge. So there. You see that? Look, 60 volts. As if, as if the diode was in there. Now it rang here because I wasn't fast enough. Try it again. Not fast enough. Nope. Not fast enough. Still got it there. But you get the point. What does that mean? That means you can use a spark gap as a diode if you do it right. It's pretty hard to get that right. Yeah. Same principle, just didn't get it far enough. Well, if we scale this thing out, and uh, I don't get a very good connection, you'll see that... Oh, there's your ring. You'll see that when I don't get a good connection... If I can... Usually I do a bad job at getting a connection, and now I can get a good connection. <laughs> well, you saw it what I was trying to describe to you. There you go. So as if the diode wasn't there. Or was there, I mean. So the last thing I want to show you is what happens um, when I just use a wire with a diode. So I told you that I could get the same result with a regular wire. Well, I'm going to attempt to do exactly that. This is just a red piece of wire I had laying around. So I'm going to solder that on there so it makes my life easier. And uh, hook up my probes again. Charge this side up. Single pulse. I'm going to run it so you can see where it is. So there's where the voltages are now. So here we go. Do it again. We had the uh, we had the position over too far. We couldn't capture it. So this is across the diode. So with just a wire, right? I was able to actually get this much transferred from this capacitor to this capacitor. Just a wire. So that proves you don't really need a solenoid wound inductor. A single wire is an in, is an inductor. It's a conductor, 
and also an inductor. So what we should be able to do is zoom in really close and you see this here. We're going to try to get an oscillation out of the wire. So I'm going to remove the diode. We're going to try to see if we can actually visually see that the wire ringing. Got a bad jumper there. Okay. All right. So here we go. See if we can see that ring. Oh, I forgot to put it on the trigger, but you saw it there. Let me do it on the so we can trigger it. There we go. <laughs> bad connection, but look at that transfer. One more time. I wanted to show you that nice ring. Here we go. Yeah, a little bit of a ring there. Now there's one more thing I want to show you as well actually. So I'm going to turn on the math function. And the math function is adding. So it's right here, the mean of the math. Turn this on run. So I'm going to connect the, not this inductor, not the other one. Get me a little solder here. So what I want to show you is pretty cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing we did earlier. But just to prove a point that the energy is flowing back and forth and back and forth equally. This red line, if there's any deviation, should change. If there's any deviation in the total voltage across the capacitors right in the system it should change so any change indicates a gain or a loss of some kind somehow in the system so here we go oh I'm way too far in aren't I let's do that again all right Here we go. Wow. Gotta go more. All right, do it again. Ah, a little special little thing right there. You see that? Okay, so as you can see, besides that little blip, which I'll talk about in a minute, as you can see, that red line, the math, is just totally flat. I'm gonna actually use an even bigger scale so you can really see it. So this is this brings up a great point. What was that? Well that was a deviation of the difference in voltage. Which normally you shouldn't see especially with a semiconductor. Why? Because you make a solid connection. There's no chance for something to spark there where I sparked it. Okay, so now I'm going to do something that's really interesting as a little teaser. It involves a reed switch because I can use a reed switch as a very easy way to make a bad connection, which is a good thing in the case that we're trying to demonstrate here. So let me set that up. All right, so here is our little reed switch. Really need a little bit more solder. Actually, before I solder it, I'll show you what it is. So a reed switch is a magnetic switch. So when it's under a magnetic field, it'll close. These are normally open. They also make normally closed ones. So I'm going to go ahead and solder this in the circuit so it's open you gotta be careful soldering with your scope leads on there you melt everything okay so now we're gonna get the exact same effect I'm gonna use a a um, 
well, if I can find some magnets, let's see, I got them laying everywhere. So I've got a magnet attached to this just to use it easy here. So I'm going to demonstrate the exact same thing with a reed switch. Remember, the math is indicating a difference across the capacitors. Okay, so let's just see how it works. So there you go. I am actually going to bring the math scaling back where it needs to be a little bit better so we can see what I'm going to show you here in a minute. Alright, so there it is. Okay, I'm going to do that again. Alright, here we go. So you can see, just as I showed you on the um, on the wire, where, you know, when I could tap it, I could act as if there was a diode there. So now I'm going to show you something just real interesting. If I don't break this one. I already busted one earlier. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this tweezers, and I'm going to tap on this. Now, remember, any deviation in the math here means that we have a net gain or a net positive of our total potential. Because we already proved to ourselves that, except for that spike earlier, which was a bad connection, which is what we're going to be doing now is a bad connection or a spark gap. This is the closest you're going to get to a spark gap in a system like this. So what you're going to actually see is a deviation, a net gain or a net loss. Let's see if we can do it. You ready? Oh, we need to do it better than that. So here again, is as it made it, right? It transferred, then it couldn't go anywhere. And it transferred back because it did the exact same thing. So I'm going to keep doing this until I get a really good one for you. Oh, that's an okay one, but not what I'm looking for. Or many. Remember, let's do it from the bottom because it depends on which way the, the switch is made. So remember, any deviation any deviation in the red line indicates a net gain or a net positive. And or a, something that the system basically is trying to flow one way and it can't. It gets disrupted. Right, this is actually a very important thing. I wasn't going to bring this up yet, but hey, we're doing it. So, right at the beginning, okay, of a switch closure, right when it closes before current can flow, something happens. Right when you disconnect it, before the current can make it through the loop, something happens. This is that something. Okay, let's see if we can get it even better. It works really good when you attach this thing to a bit of a longer lead, so let me set that up. All right, this allows me to tap it a little bit easier. Let's see if I can do it. I just literally barely want those contacts to make. There you go. So, you can see a little bitty tiny spike there where they touched. They made good contact. They were flowing current. And then all of a sudden, it got disrupted. And it bounced. And that bounce is the disruption of the common standard transfer of potential. I'm going to do it a few more times to see if we can really get it going. Sometimes you can really get it crazy. And it just really depends on how you, how well it makes. Same thing, that's on the back side. Do it again. Whoa, look at that. Okay. Well, not quite as good as I hoped, but it's okay. Try it from the bottom. Maybe, maybe we can get it from the bottom better here. <laughs> it's 
pretty difficult. Let's um, let's go out pretty far and see if we can really oh, see if we can really get it here. A little bit. So you can see it only closed once, and it opened, and it closed again, and didn't even make it back to. Um, back to the middle there. I'll try it a few more times, see if we can get a really good one. Now sometimes you can actually take the magnets and you can get them to work really, really well. Because it actually like flickers. So couple spots right there. Let's do it again. If you hold it on the side, it's like fluttering in between. A few more. I'll do it a few more times for you. But you can take this how you want it, but the point is is that it's sort of like a net loss or a net gain. And we'll probably eventually get into exactly how to use it. Did I not charge it? Oh, boys. All right. Well, that's about all I wanted to show you. It's if you made it this far, you made it to the good stuff, which is what I'm showing you right now. I'll do it again. I've managed some pretty amazing scope shots, but I just took a few pictures, so I can throw them up on the screen. I can show you some serious like, disruptions. That's a pretty good one. So this is this is this is important. That's all I'm going to tell you at the moment because that's all I really need to tell you. A lot of you know what it is already. How to apply it even. That was a good one. We'll leave it hanging at that. So remember, before current can flow, before current can stop, it's like a water hammer effect. This is like a water hammer effect. Same thing. And that is super destructive. And the force within a water hammer far exceeds normally what you'd see in a system when it's working properly, right? This is the same thing here. It's very, very similar. So we'll play with this another day, another time, but for now, that's it. Signing out. Thanks for watching. God bless. Have a good day. Read the Bible more. Bye-bye.